Hi, guys. Hello, folks. Okay, so you have not read the first five books of the Song of Ice and Fire series, also known as Game of Thrones. Don't watch this video. If you Even if you have read it, if you don't want to know uh, some predictions about what might happen, don't watch this video. And that last part is the key to this video. If you don't want predictions about the end, don't watch this video, because we're going to focus on what is... Not necessarily my theory, it's an amalgam, but for the most part, this is my construction. Um, so, if I'm 50% right, I may be about to reveal how this ends. How the, the final battle, uh, which will be the title of this one. So, she's here to help guide me along and make sure I'm being clear, because this is a complicated one. An I, extremely complicated one. I think I'm going to be real quiet for a long time. Go ahead. Okay. And by the way, may I say one thing? Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to give a big shout out to Charlie in Westeros. Yes, Yay! watch his videos, Charlie in Westeros. It's great. Um, and thank you for your comments, Charlie. And also, Tony Teflon. Tony Teflon. I think you're doing some great videos. Don't always agree with you, but hey, I'm sure you don't agree with yeah. us either. Um, but you're, you're getting out there and you're putting some intellectual stuff out, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is James's theory. Okay. So I'm, I'm just That's here as a, I'm sorry, I'm just here as um, an interloper. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with the Children of the Forest and the First Men. What we know is that the, for, the First Men came to Westeros and did not get along with the Children of the Forest. Whether that was their fault or the children in the forest, we're not 100% sure, but we kind of get the impression that it's the first men's fault. Well, they're the conquerors. Yeah, the yes. conquerors. Um, when they came over, the first men, the children of the forest um, did something to the stepstones, which are the bridge of landmass between the bottom of Westeros, southeast Westeros, Four. and southwest Essos, which is where the first men came across. Right. The children of the forest did something to them that broke them up, made it difficult to go across them, but it was too late. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. And later in the war, they did another thing, which is referred to as magic, to reroute rivers or ocean water into the Reach. neck. Uh, I'm sorry, the Into neck. the neck of Westeros. And whatever they were trying to do, flood it, didn't work. So they ended up with a bunch of marshlands, and it did not keep the First Men from going into the north area. And after that, the children of the forest kind of gave up on trying to win the battle. And apparently the first men were having some issues too, because they agreed at the God's Eye, they made a pact, the God's Eye Pact. And if you don't know, after that, they, the children of the forest planted a bunch of werewoods on the um, Isle of Faces, which is the island. So the God's Eye is a big lake with an island, a circular lake with an island in the middle. And the island in the middle is where they made the pact. And the children of the forest planted a bunch of werewoods. Okay. If they weren't there before. If Well, it says they planted them in oh, the does? books. It does. It okay. says they planted them and carved faces in them. Um, and there's still rumors that there are green men on the Isle of Faces. Love that green the, man. Yeah. The stepstones and the flooding of the neck are, by my opinion, that is because the Green Seer can actually, if he's strong enough, move werewoods. The werewoods had reached over into Essos through the Stepstones, and he had moved them in order to stop the First Men from coming over, but it was too late, and then used the werewoods to reroute the rivers, but it didn't work. There wasn't enough water in order to flood the neck. All right, so that's a little bit of a side note. But when they had the pact, the long not when they made the pact of the God's Eye, the long night happened soon after that. Okay. So here's the theory with that little section. Before First Men ever got to Westeros, it was the Children of the Forest and the others. Pretend that hundreds of thousands of years ago, there was a different creature from First Men, from Children of the Forest, from others. A different creature. From which all three of these creatures came from. Kind of like an evolution. Some of, the, some of this particular creature ended up in the ice area and evolved into the others. 
and some of them ended up in the north of Westeros in that area, involved into the Children of the Force, and Man ended up in Essos and evolved into Man. Okay? If Man was not in Westeros, then Children of the Forest and the others might have had some difficulties over land area. Imagine that they had a pact. I'm not going to get too deeply into it, but the deal is, if the Children of the Forest's hierarchy depends on who is the strongest warg, and it tends, we, did, we kind of assume it's a male, it is in the video of history and lore, and the other's hierarchy depends on a female by lineage, then they could have merged those two and created a new lineage, whether it was will willingly, whether there was some stealing of another person, but if they melded those houses, the female other, the male children of the force, and mated their children together, which is why we got the Targaryens to justify it, then that would have solidified them. Well, if the children of the forest later warred with first men, the children of the forest are little. The first men are big, similar to the others. So that, to in order to resolve that conflict, the children of the forest's male heir, the strongest warg, would have had to marry the <coughs> first men's female heir. And if the children of the forest did that at the god's eye to resolve their differences, then by doing so, the children of the forest breached their pact with the others, which would be why the <coughs> others... That was our cat picking on our dog. dog. Then the children of the forest would have breached their pact with the others, which would explain why the others went to war, and arguably there was a female heir to the children of the forest throne and the other throne, who was not given her due, who would have fought back. Through that, there is a female le lineage left lost somewhere in this, okay? And she's important later, but we'll get to that. But for now, the importance is, that's why the others fought. And they got forced above the wall when the wall was built by Bran the Builder. If the children of the forest married the first men, then their children would have been the heirs to the Greenseer throne, whoever was the strongest warg amongst, amongst them. That is the Starks. That's where the Starks come from. They are the result of the pact between the gods, the children of the forest, and the first men. Okay? Eventually, after the others are forced up above the wall and lose the battle, the another, an ultimate heir of the Starks named Brandon, Brandon the Builder, was both a king of Winterfell and the strongest warg. So he built the wall. Just like the children of the forest broke the stepstones, just like the children of the forest rerouted the, the rivers into the neck, Bran the Builder built the wall out of weirwood trees, literally growing out of the ground. Over time, they got bigger. Over time, they connected to each other. Over time, they collected ice, which we see in Varamyr Sixkin's chapter, the uh, weirwoods collecting ice. And in John's chapters, we also know that the Night's Watch has put more and more ice blocks on top of it, put more and more rocks on top of it, and etc., etc. It's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger over the years. Okay. So it wasn't built by giants. It wasn't built by giants. And that is also why there is an area beyond the wall that the Night's Watch continually removes any other trees from. It's so that they can see... But it's also so the wall can maintain its um, water sources, all of that. Okay. So might, might argue so that other people above the wall can't utilize them. Can't utilize them. Now, when they built the wall, some of the humans were left above the wall, trapped. And over time, the people on the wall felt like they weren't just fighting the others to keep them out, not really fighting the others, they're kind of dormant. They weren't really fighting the others, they're now fighting the wildlings, because the wildlings kind of want in, or want resources, and have issues. There's even the song of Bard, um, the... Bale the Bard. Bale the Bard, who uh, is a wildling. Oh, Long so you story. would say the grass is always greener. The grass is always greener, great point. Mama. The Earlier I mentioned the female 
other children of the forest who was usurped by her brother or whoever who married the the first man her lineage end up ended up above the wall okay all right so we're done with the children of the forest and the first man for a little bit now let's talk about the knights king what we know about the knights king supposedly is that he could have been a flint a nori a Woodfoot, an Umber, a Magnar of Skagos, a Bolton, or a Stark. And old Nan says, I know she he was a Stark, but it's mythology. What are we going to do with that? The story of the Knights... like old Nan. We love old Nan. The story of the Knights King is that he ended up on the wall, became Lord Commander, and fell in love or beckoned a female other in, and mated with her and claimed a kingdom on the wall. And what we really know after that is just that the king above the wall and the king below the wall went to war with him, killed him and his wife. Okay? Who That's were the considered st- evil. Who were considered evil. That's the story of the Knights King. That's it. Okay? It's very important here that I reference Veramir Sixkin's chapter. There's a couple of things you need to know. Very okay. important. It is chapter. arguably the most important chapter in every single one of these books. It really and truly, if you haven't read it like three or four times, I think you really need to. It's the prologue to Dance with Dragons. I Dance with Dragons. Big time. Here's a couple of things you need to hear from it. Vermeer Sixkins mentions some of the morality that comes with warging. You're not supposed to warg an animal and eat man flesh, which he does in that chapter, but you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to have sex. war with an animal while it's having sex. Right. Um, some of the key points. When you war with a wolf, it's for life. It's called a marriage almost. You're not literally devoted to them sexually, but you will never be not connected to them. You are permanently connected to them. It's an umbilical cord between you and your wolf. Number one. Um, number two, you're not supposed to stay in your animal for too long because it will overcome you. It will be, You will become it. It will become you. And there's no separating the and two. And arguably that might be become more animalistic as opposed to human. And it depends on the animal you're doing, too. You'll get different traits from each one. Right. The guy who teaches Vermeer says birds are the worst. That's so that's two things. Another thing, th- these are huge, so remember them. Vermeer Siskins says, he in the initial part of that chapter, he's warded in his own wolf. His wolves are Vermeer starving in a tent. A in, a, in a home, a building. And dying from a wound, arguably. But he's warding into one of his three wolves. And they track down two or three men and one woman. And the woman has a baby. That's right. And when the wolves track her down, they see that her dugs, her breasts, are full of milk. And they're kind of, like, interested in that. And But more importantly, they notice the baby. And it says, the meat on the pup is the sweetest. Remember that. The meat on the pup is the sweetest. The other thing that's important in Veramir Sixkin's chapter, which will come in later, much later, is that Veramir Sixkin has died eight or nine times. I forget which number it is. He's died eight or nine times, including one where his father put an axe through his head when he was bored into his his dog when he was a little kid. They were afraid of him. He was so powerful. True. But he says in that chapter that the most painful death he ever had yeah. happened just recently when he was battling with Mance Raider at the wall. He had stolen Orel's eagle and was inside Orel's eagle during the war. And he felt what felt like a flaming arrow pierce him, but there was no flaming arrow. And he said that it burned extremely hot. It was the worst pain he'd ever felt. And he felt like his pain and fear fed the flames and made it stronger. And that for a second, he went mad. That was hell. Before before then entering his own, um, before then returning to his own mind. Okay? So, remember those. All right, so... Imagine that there's the king of Winterfell, king of, in the north. But the Starks also have a claim to the Green Seer throne. So there's a combination of these two powers together that makes the unification of man work. One kind of keeps the others at bay, and the 
other one um, is keeps man at bay. It's the combination of the two. But when you build the wall, you've kind of slowly lost your connections between them, but not entirely. So imagine that there's a king in Winterfell who has three sons. His eldest son is a noble, noble boy, but he doesn't have any warding abilities. I'm making this up, by the way, and I may be wrong on this, but it paints the picture for what I believe Martin's going to do. And he may just be a regular warg. The eldest son, maybe. But the, let's per, say for a minute that there's three I'm sons. Say, oh, you keep talking. The eldest son is noble, but is not a warg. The second son is the most powerful. There, one in 1,000 men is a... One in 1,000 children of the forest is a warg. One in 10,000 wargs is a green seer. Well, imagine one in 1,000 green seers. They're extremely powerful. They're the uberman. And I would argue Brandon the Builder was one of those. So the second son of the is... the first men. It's the first men we define them by. Not children of the forest. It's, so the second... The first son is noble, but not a warg. The second son is one of the most powerful wargs that has ever come around. That's scary. But he's not a very good guy. He's a young kid, let's say 10, but he's doing messed up stuff. His brother knows it. Now imagine that their dad dies. The elder brother gets Winterfell, but he knows his younger brother cannot be trusted. So what does he do? He sends his younger brother to the wall. And his younger brother feels like he's been betrayed. I don't want to go to the wall. Are you kidding me? Not to mention, if he knows anything about the Green Seer throne, he probably thinks he's entitled to it. So he goes to the wall. If you're an extremely powerful warg, you're extreme you're able to easily manipulate other people. Not just that, but oh, the point being that he would be easily become the Lord Commander, and it would be something he would want. Now, it says that the Knights King stole a female other. I think that's a ruse, because that's what we've been told throughout all this. It's, what, it's the subjugation of women. It's what we've always told, but the female others... I think it might be an unreliable story. It's mythology. It's easily unreliable. Agreed. Just like we don't know who the Knights King is. The female others are the leaders of the others. It's what... Like I said, like I said earlier, if there was a diver, uh, a separation of these the species that ended up resulting in the others, the children of the forest and first men, and I'm making a leap here, but just get the idea of the culture of the others. If you're limited food, extreme cold, it's likely that the ones that would survive would be the ones that work together. The ones that become so empathic, empathic with each other that they don't fight with each other and that they do whatever they're commanded without question. And so imagine that the others actually have children out there and women that they absolutely love. And imagine that the others never fight each other. They're like a Borg. They're not like a Borg. No, not like a Borg. They are extremely empathetic. They're kind and sweet. The boards don't... The emotion's irrelevant. That is okay. completely missing the okay. point. Okay, uh, it's fine. The others are arguably better than humans because they, there is no war of the five kings. Okay? And when the Vi Imagine the Vikings invading England. You wouldn't have seen any female Vikings for the most part because it would have been their men that invaded. That's why we only see male others. So imagine that there's this female descendant of both the children of the forest and the other who ended up being commingled with the wildlings and kind of trapped or not knowing her role, her abilities as far as having claimed the other throne. Well, imagine through her descendancy, eventually one of the females knows that that's her right. And don't forget what the wild, how the wildlings choose their leader or ch how they marry. They have to track down the female. So if a guy wants to marry a girl, he has to capture her. It's a, it was a similar thing that went on in Greek culture. But he has to capture her. Well, that would make it so that if her family didn't want him to capture her, they would stop him. Well, if the female was the key to the throne, then the entire society could, could possibly stop the male from getting her to keep him from taking the throne. 
Well, that would be how the children of the forest and the others would, would mate, because it would be the strongest war and the lineage of the females. So imagine the others are extremely empathetic and they do everything they're told, which I think is the key to the end of this. The others are completely empathetic. It's just that they're being manipulated. The others are not the evil. So imagine that this female, who appears as a human, though she's got blue eyes, she's been mating with humans for a very long time. She's her got family. Her family, her extended relatives. She's got blue eyes, she's got other kind of hair, and she's gorgeous. She... Now, arguably, the Night's King stole her. He, if he's an extremely powerful warg, he could have stolen her and raped her. He could arguably have warped her into his bed. But I think that that's a farce. The truth is, she was extremely evil. And she wanted power. And she found him and told him, I know what you are. I know what you are. You're one of the strongest wargs that's ever lived. And I know what you want. If you mate with me, if you marry me, we can have it all. We can have absolutely everything. So they marry. And the Lord Commander, the Night's King of the Night's Watch, says, I'm, I'm king. I'm claiming the wall as a kingdom. Now his noble brother tells uh, in the south, arguably would have been like, don't that's not the way it's supposed to happen, but I'm not going to go to war over this. If he's going to keep the wall and protect it, that's okay. Now, the story doesn't say that. The story just goes straight into them going to war, and that's fine. The way Martin writes these stories, he is putting us into situations that excite our emotions to an extreme extent, whether it be in a love situation or a sad situation or an angry situation. We are we associate ourselves with situations emotionally. Humanity. We associate ourselves with situations emotionally. That's what the Red Wedding is for. I believe that when the Stark eldest brother went to treat with his eld with his younger brother to say, I don't agree with you, but if you're gonna take the wall, that's fine. Just be sure to protect it. When he went, the Knights King and his Knights Queen already knew what they were going to do. They want the world. They don't want the wall. They want the world. So, the elder brother shows up, and we get a red wedding scene. But just like Manderley did to um, the phrase, the Night's King feeds his elder brother's children to him to end his lineage. And that's the rat's cook. But the Rat's Cook story, if, any, if anybody out there isn't quite sure, is that, um, we, do, you, do you remember? Do you want to give it? Give me the Rat Cook story. You do. Okay. So the Rat Cook um, fed his king, was on the wall, and when the king came to visit, he fed the king's children to the king. And he was cursed thereafter to haunt the halls and only be able to feed off his chil off his children's souls. Okay. So, when the Knights King's brother showed up, the Knights King and his Knights Queen killed the eldest brother's kids and fed it to him. It's meant to be a combination of Manderley and the Red Wedding so that when we hear one sentence about what actually happened in the 6th or 7th book, we immediately associate all this emotion with it. Okay. All right, here's here we're going to now begins the key to this, okay? Then this then the king of winter, the king below the wall and the king above the wall go to war. They kill the knights king and the knights queen. That's in that's in the mythology. Uh if you watch the history and lore, they they actually show the knights queen being stabbed with the stick and that's how we kind of know that that's what happened that she was actually killed. The mythology says, just says they killed the Night's King. Here's what, here's what I'm adding. When they showed up, they killed the Night's King, and they killed the Night's Queen. But there was also a baby. And they couldn't bring themselves to kill the baby. And just like Ned says, the man who passes the sentence must swing the sword. But they couldn't do it. They couldn't kill a baby. So they left the baby in the woods to die. In the woods above the wall to die. 
and they took the body of the Night's King and buried it, which is what the Starks do. It's what the Northmen do with their um, dead. They bury them. And him being such an evil person, they buried him in a place that was dark and deep that they thought no one would ever be able to find. The Fist of the First Men. When the first men, above the wall and below it, united to stop what could have been an ultimate evil taking over the world. The Night's Queen and the Night's King. So they bury him under the first men. Here's what they didn't know. When they killed the Night's Queen, the Night's King watched it happen. When they killed the Night's King, he was a consummate warg. He couldn't warg into any of the men around him because they were all against him and they would have reacted similar to the girl that's with Vermeer. She rips her eyes out when he tries. So what does the Night King do? He wargs into his own child. And they left him out in the woods. They left the baby out in the woods. We've seen that season four. We've so seen that, but that ties in in a minute. With Rast bleeding the baby. So when he, he, he's in the mind of a child and he's left in the middle of the woods, he is left with wanting all of the kingdoms. He's left watching his, the love of his life die in front of him. Now we can say she was evil, but if you're in love with someone, you don't care. You're in love with who they are, especially they if you're evil. And that's how we flip it. We've constantly had an evil person have someone that's not evil with them. It's rare that we get a combination of evil people. That's where this is headed. So the Night's King warred into this baby and is left in the middle of the woods above the wall. He's forced to feed himself, which means he's warging into the animals around him in order to feed him. And that has to happen for at least 10 years. You need to clarify. Yeah. He's warged into the baby. He's I'm, in not, his... I'm not necessarily buying into this, but if I am, he has warged himself into his own child. And how do you sustain yourself as a child? You warg other things around you. So he's warging animals to come and be sacrificed in front of him in order for this baby to eat. Or to facilitate him. He's warging wolves to come and nurse off of. He's, the Night's King is warging all these different animals to feed him. So for 10 years, he's becoming all these animals. And not just that, but he's in the mind of a baby. And babies are born manipulative. They are the cutest, sweetest things, and we owe them all our attention. But babies start manipulating within the first minute after being born. That's why they know that when they cry, they get nursed. It's a combination, and ultimately they, their morality gets honed. Here's the most important part. The, the meat on the pup is the sweetest. That's Faramir's story. When the Night's King warred into his son, it wasn't just, I'm going to be safe. It was the sweetest feeling he'd ever had his entire life. It was youth. It was freedom. It was, ev it was vitality. It was everything. It, it's being, he became a heroin addict as soon as he did that. It was the fountain of youth. Can you, can it's not. You it's not the it? fountain of youth, though, because that's not the point. The point is that he. It's the feeling, the milk on the the meat on the pup is the sweetest. It it thrilled him. It filled him with complete passion. It was like an orgasm, times three thousand. Now he's in this baby feeding himself. Now this baby becomes ten, eleven, twelve years old, and he can he can go wherever he wants. The uh, the Night's King can go wherever he wants. He can walk wherever he wants. Let me back you up here. You have to, you have to. If you're buying into this, you have to presume that the two Starks have bound him, that bound the Night's King in some way. No, 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 no. He broke his oath, in my opinion. He broke his oath, which is why he's not allowed to go back and forth between the Werewoods. Um, either that, and that also doesn't. So wait for a split second on that. I'll say. That. So. He's warged into his kid, okay? And don't forget that that kid is part other, part children of the forest, and part human. That kid is the one who has the right to all the thrones. Not him. He could claim it, but that kid's the one who can actually it's kind of three heads have a dragon. claim. So, he's warged into this kid. The kid gets to be about 10, 11, 12 years old. Now the kid goes to fu the Night's King. It's the kid's body, but it's the Night's King's mind. And the kid is trapped beneath him. The Night's King goes to find his body. 
buried beneath the first men. And when he finds it, it's a white. Which it would be because he was mating with a female other. So he puts his mind into the white. Now he's immortal. He has no need to eat. He has no need to sleep. He has no need to breathe. He has been tainted by bloodlust and envy, and the only thing he wants is power and to feed off the souls of children. That is why you saw Rast carrying that baby in the trailer, because he's offering it to, Cold, to the Night's King, and the Night's King is Cold Hands, and he's been waiting for 6,000 years for his plan to come to fruition. But the issue is, he can't sit on that green seer throne because he broke his oath, and beca or because he's a white. I don't quite have that worked out. Mm. Some of that combination makes it so he can't go into that green seer throne. He also can't go below the wall because he's arguably he can't go below the wall because he broke his oath, and he can't go into the green seer throne because he's a white. Some combination thereof. Now go back to his son. When, he, when the Night's King put his mind into his original body, his son is now left without his dad in his mind. But what does Vermeer say? When you warg a wolf, it's for life. It's a marriage. Imagine warging your own. Imagine warging a child. It's for life. It's like a marriage. Now imagine it being your own son. And don't forget, the Night's King is extremely powerful. So his son can go below the wall. The Night's King's mind can't go below the wall, but his son can. And his son, in my opinion, because of leeches, has been manipulating the situation for, for 6,000 years in the north and the south, below, everything below the wall, in order to try to create a situation. And he's doing it under his dad's instruction. This guy is trying to create a situation where his dad can come in and take over. To some extent. There's so, he's, he has got a connection to his dad where his dad's telling him something. And his dad's telling him, if you do X, you'll get Y. And you've got a thousand years to do And it, it keeps happening. Every time he, his dad tells him he'll get something, he gets it. Every, but every plan keeps failing. It keeps failing over and over and over. But you got a lifetime to keep failing. But you got a lifetime to keep failing. And I bet you, if you read the Princess and the Queen, that we're going to find out that in the Princess and the Queen, this son was involved in that. And he's the one who, I don't want to spoil the ending, but he's the one who disappears from the Red Keep and later brings a missing character back to a particular place. That was very vague, but I don't want to spoil the story for it if you haven't read it. So... He's, he, that's why we get told that the Night's King was a Flint, a Bolton, a Stark, a Nori, a Woodfoot, an Umber, and a Magnar of Skagos because he is all of those things. Not him, but his son. He has been to all these different places trying to take over. In my opinion, Heron the Black was this kid. Who, and he was originally an Ironborn. Yes. It's been going over and over that's and over definite. again, and he's, he's old and extremely old. It's like reincarnation. I think, I think the others live for a very long time compared to humans, but this particular child, the Night's King's son, is being kept youthful because he's been using leeches, arguably, as virgins. And what does Heron the Black's wife do? Bathes in virgin blood. I bet. Because she was aging and her husband wasn't. And she couldn't figure out how it was not it was keep, happening. Couldn't keep... Uh, being a trophy wife. Now take a quick second to it's think. Like, that's a comment on plastic surgery. Interesting. I, I it's I disagree it's, because plastic it's, surgery is not quite as evil as, bath thing as bathing in virgin's yeah. bloods. So take a quick second to who I'm thinking about when I say that the Night's King's son is still alive, being manipulated by his dad, who's telling him all these things he's going to have and be king of the north, everything in the world, and he's been doing it for. A very long time. If you could keep doing things over and over again, don't you think finally you might succeed? Forever young. Forever young. It's Roose Bolton. Okay. He is not the Night's King. He is not the Night's King. He's got the Night's King talking to him once in his head. I think he's constantly present. That's And I think the Night's King told him, tell... And don't forget that if the Night's King had... Okay. Let me add one more thing to this. 
Eventually, the Night's King finds somebody on the wall who has, this is like 150 years ago, is that about right? 150 years ago, he finds a guy who's on the wall who has got some interest in the black arts, and he seduces him into telling him, I can, I can show you things. Come with me, I'll get you, I'll show you things. That's Blood Raven, and that's what happened. The Night's King is manipulating Blood Raven. If you read the Duncan Egg Tales, the Mystery Knight, it kind of implies that at the end of the Mystery Knight, Blood Raven got his own egg. <laughs> if the Night's King was able to get into Blood Raven's mind, he would know where that egg was. Also, the Night's King cannot go into that Green Seer throne because he's blocked. It's warded. It's correct. It's Somehow, warded. It's and I warded. think that that's because he's a white. Something that the Children of the Forest has done is keeping out whites. Or the original Green Seer. So he can't go in, but Blood Raven can. Blood Raven is not a war. Even though he arguably has North Blood in him, he is not really a war. He might have had a little bit of warging, but he's not really a war. But he had an egg. And he could sit on that Green Seer throne. And, and he has tar blood. True. He I don't think that matters, but I, I he think does, it does have matter. Uh, well if my story does go not. Ahead. He gets Blood Raven to sit on that throne. The Night's King can't go in there, and Blood Raven's not a, a Green Seer, so Blood Raven, or excuse me, the Night's King really doesn't have any control over the Green Seer throne through that situation, but he can at least see through the Werewoods, which means the Night's King knows everything that's going on. Anytime anybody talks in private near a Werewood, he knows it. He, he's a puppet master. He's a puppet master. Okay, so, but that's why he, so here's the combination that is going to work for him. He, he's finally got all three things he needs. He's got, in my opinion, Blood Raven's Dragon. This is a stretch. This is the biggest stretch out of all of us. With this. But he's got Blood Raven's Dragon born deep within those caverns. Blood Raven took that egg in with him, which was probably the Night's King's only way to get Blood Raven to trust him. I'll let you take the egg in there. You can take the egg. The egg is deep within those that cave and has been birthed. Bear with me. Believe that that's happening, okay? It's a worm, which is what dragons were. They were worms. They just had wings. So, And I think it has a wings, but it's a worm. Deep within the caves, just like all the other dragons are digging Avon, tunnels. This one's digging tunnels, okay? And arguably, the Night's King, because he's such a consummate warg, might be able to warg that dragon. Maybe. Maybe. Okay? So, number one, he's got a dragon in there, and you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with his plan? I'm going to tell you in just a second. In order for Blood Ra uh, in order for the Night's King to win, he needs the Green Seer throne. That's all he needs. But he can't go into the Green Seer throne directly because it's a, it's, it's he's warded by warded the werewoods by the were by the werewoods or some kind of spell, and he can't go below the wall. But if he can get an extremely powerful ward to sit on the throne, the Green Seer throne, and manipulate that gr that Green Seer warg into taking the wall down, now the Knights King can go below the wall. And that is done by convincing Bran he has to do it. And which he's been, been doing it since the second paragraph of the first, first book. First book. So that gets the wall down. And I think it'll be John coming back from Hard Home with all these kids and children from Hard Home and the others on their tail. And then you get the Night's King through Blood Raven whispering in Bran's ear, You've got to take it down, Bran. And Bran takes it down. That gets him. That gets the Night's Tell King. Tell him why he takes it down. That gets the Night's King below the wall with all his army. But Bran wouldn't do it for. Bran without would, a re Bran wouldn't reason. take the wall down without a reason. And he's going to do it to protect John. And all those children, and people. Now the wall's down, but that doesn't get him the Green Seer throne. In order to make sure that the Night's King doesn't have to fight men, that he can protect himself with the others, but not really fight men. He needs, the Night's King needs his son to create complete chaos. The Red Wedding, convincing the Freys that they've got power, getting Roos to get Ramsay to go to all these different places in the north and eat all their food and destroy them and create complete chaos. Um, 
to think make the Lannisters think they're go, they're going to win. He doesn't care about the South, though. He doesn't care about the South, because all he needs is the Green Seer throne, and he can almost control the world. So the Lannisters, that's... The Lannisters, the Varys, all that stuff, that's a, that's tertiary to what he he concern, his, he's concerned with. So now he's got the wall down, because Bran did it. He's got chaos in the north, because he's got his son to do it. And number three, he's got a dragon in those caves. And arguably, the werewoods are feeding off a water source, which arguably is the same water source beneath Winterfell, the hot springs. Even the pond that's next to the the heart God's tree, wood. the God's Wood, the heart tree in Winterfell has a pool next to it, which Asha says she never felt the bottom. And Bran says, Asha says maybe it didn't have a bottom. Okay, so I'm going to veer off that for a split second because I need you to hear this. She, this is the part she hates me to talk about, but I'm going to do it anyway. Imagine for a second... Arya is a faceless man. She comes to Westeros with the goal of killing Ramsay because somebody who Ramsay has her tortured or something, I guarantee you, has prayed to the faceless god to kill and argue to kill Ramsay. Ramsay is what she's coming after. And in my opinion, Littlefinger will have already traded Sansa to the Boltons in exchange for their allegiance, which means Ramsay now has the real uh, uh, has Sansa. Air. Instead of a fake one, Jane Poole, he has Sansa. The real heir to the real, Winterfell. The real heir to Winterfell. As and they've far been as, dying for Winterfell. And that you get this whole situation where Sansa's trying to manipulate Ramsay in order to keep him from hurting How her, and it gets switched from domination to submission. But whatever. Arya shows up and kills Ramsay. And it's perfect. They're the flayed men. And that's what she's been taught to do with flaying faces but off. But it'll be bittersweet and because Ram Ramsay was manipulated as well. Hold up a split second. You're right about that. Her point is that if Sansa has now flipped R Ramsay into being a submissive. puppy, a submissive puppy, a then just when we start to think, you know what, this might work, Sansa finally has her dog. No, no hear me out on that. It's this dog she's manipulated. She's a singer. But we've kind of gotten a little empathetic with Ramsay because we realize it's a power play, and as long as you keep him subservient... He'll, he functions completely fine. Um, then Arya shows up and kills him, so it's bittersweet. And she flays him after she uses her wolves to chase him down, just like he's been doing the whole time. I'm going to skip a lot of stuff that I've talked about in other videos, but ultimately you get a huge battle at Harrenhal. You get Arya, Sansa, and Jon all riding dragons. Um, now Arya, who, and Arya has kind of come back a little bit. She's starting, she, she finally sees Sansa with Jon. She might even see her mom, I'm not sure about that. But she starts to come back and think, this is who I, she's not herself right now. She's an invisible character. She's starting to come back. I've talked about this in a previous video, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's the point of this video. So she is a loner though. Now the Battle of Harrenhal's over and Arya has her own dragon. She's scouting to the north. John's getting the idea that the, the real battle is further north, that he needs to go there, and we already know that because um, we got the some kind of creepy laughter after Bran gets convinced to take the wall down. And I would bet you that the next book ends with Roose Bolton seeing his dad for the first time. In six, I bet it's the epilogue of the next book. Roose Bolton seeing his dad for the first time in almost 6,000 years and thinking, I'm finally going to get everything I wanted. I'm finally going to be king of the north. I've done everything he's ever wanted. And he's basically a god. It's both his father and a god, which is a perfect for an atheist like Martin to do. It is the idea of the Yahweh, a father figure. He, he goes to him and says, I've done everything you ever wanted, dad. He, I've, I've even got, okay. And his dad says, thank you. And sucks his fucking soul, sucks his soul in feeds off of it because he doesn't care about his son he has no he does not care at all but the only way he can do that is if he has a an heir to the ultimate throne an heir to the ultimate throne can't be a male it needs to be a female and roos bolton Why? it needs to be a female because the others only listen to a female there's a there's a glit there's a part of the story that i'm leaving out because i'm not 100 percent sure about it the way the knight's king is manipulating the others 
he's actually in control of them right now. The others listen to two things, in my opinion. They, they listen to the Queen and possibly to the Werewoods. But I don't think the Night's King has access to using the Werewoods yet. He can just kind of see through them because of Blood Raven. I think it's possible, and this is random, crows used to be able to talk, right? And they spoke a different language than English, right? And man used to, it says that in the book, the man used to be able to speak the language. Um, because crows can still talk, it's just the man used, okay. Well, watch the scene in the first, in the second season, at the end of the second season, where the other comes in and screams. There's an argument that the language they speak is crow. It's the same language, and that's why the crows are involved. Because Don't listen to them. The crows are all liars. Crows are all liars. There's an argument that Col uh, the Night's King is using those crows to tell the others what to do. That's why the crows are chasing Sam with that baby. The Night's King wants that baby to feed off of, and the crows are telling the others where they are, which is why they're screaming before that other gets there to attack Sam and Gilly. Okay, sorry. So Arya's got a dragon, and she, they've won the Battle of Harrenhal, and they've got an inkling that the real battle is at Winterfell. Arya goes scouting on her dragon, and she spies Nymeria below her. Now, I'm, I know I'm getting real specific on my predictions. It's not meant... I'm just filling in gaps so that y'all get the gist of what I'm saying. She spies Nymeria and lands... Or she uses the skin from Ramsay to infiltrate Roose Bolton's camp in the north. It, it, this is still in the city. Okay. Roose Bolton captures Arya. Arguably with the others. And I could see Arya being a faceless man thinking, I can take them and slicing one and it getting back up. And slicing another and it getting back up. And the next thing you know, she's completely surrounded. And once she's complete... And wouldn't it be amazing if they lifted her up just like Danny did? Danny was lifted up at the end of his last season, and Roose Bolton comes out of nowhere and rapes her. And she will leave, I've talked about this in previous videos, but she'll leave um, her mind when that happens and enter Nymeria's, and we I, get a couple I, of... I need to, inter I, I need to interject this. I, I'm not buying into well, all... You don't, don't do that. You that We said that at the beginning. I, I want to say this. If I'm going to buy into this one part... This plays into the Boltons being um, having the skins of the of the Starks hanging up on the walls. Mm. It's almost like they want to be a Stark so badly. It's almost like they want to be human so badly. They want to be the rulers. And they they take their skins. They're still hanging. And it, and if he does rape Arya. He is inside of her. He is almost encased in a skin. And we've yet to see a main character raped. We've seen Lady Tonda's daughter raped, but we have not seen a main character raped. And and Martin says in one of the interviews, I need to surprise people. I need to kill off a main character. I need to have a main character raped. He says that in an interview. Now, arguably, there's been a recent release that something controversial will happen with Sansa in the next book. To me, I think that's she's going to blow Littlefinger in order to get out of having sex with him. I'm a stretch there, something. but she's not losing her virginity. Arya being raped by Roos makes sense. Now he has a claim to the North, in his opinion, and the North is completely free of everybody. He's won the war. And this mirrors the Jane Poole, the Jane uh, Poole Ramsey thing. thing. Ramsey with Sansa. And um, now... As far as the Night's King's concerned, his son, who has the actual other lineage in him, has had sex with uh, the true lineage of the Starks, arguably Sansa is arguably still the leader, uh, if not Bran Rickon, if you're going to go with the males. But there's something about the Hundredth Son, which I think really is basically predicting that Arius, that the Hundredth Son of R Roos no, will... Cold Hands. The Hundredth Son of the Hundredth Son, something about that, will be a female, which will culminate into it. I don't know that for a fact. But, rapes Arya. Arya enters Nymeria. Now we get Arya's body almost catatonic. And Roose goes to his father and says, Look at all I've done. Look at everything I've ever done for you. And his father goes, Thanks. And sucks his soul in. And we realize that Roose was a puppet in the whole thing. Roose's eerie personality, just like the Red Wedding was a was meant to pr to prompt us for later finding out what the Night's King did to his family. We were prompt with Roos to think of what this manipulative, cold, 
having no emotion, we were prompted by him in order to realize when his father kills him that if his father killed him, Roos never killed his kids. It's been implied that he did, but I mean, I think we all know it was Ramsey. Um, Roos never. When did Roos ever kill his kids? I think he just manipulates it so that somebody else does. I disagree. Roos, Roos, Roos doesn't care. He's lived forever, but he wouldn't kill his own kids. It, that's why he keeps letting Ramsey stay alive. Ramsey's just doing all these horrible things. Roos's father, the Night's King, kills Roos. All right. So final battle. Everybody in the South, we get this whole thing about Sansa having to convince everybody that they need to unite. They go up north to fight Winterfell. We're going to have a whole bunch of things about diseases and stuff like that. And who's supposed to be king. Everybody's arguing and Sansa's just like, it doesn't matter who's supposed to be king. Let's just fight this battle. Maybe Stannis will still be alive and be claiming everything. Who knows? But they get to Winterfell and have a huge fight. And I would bet you, and there's a whole thing about the Hound and Sansa in, in the previous video having sex... If they have sex and Sansa gets pregnant, now the Hound has gotten everything he wants. All he wants now is to be a knight. To, and if he went to go save Sansa, as I suggested in that video, he's going to go try to save Arya. And when he does, it will be the Hound, the true knight, the truest knight in all of these books, the Hound who kills the Night's King with, but when he, and arguably with fire, because by then he'll be okay with it. Um, because he's not scared of anything anymore. But when he kills the Night's King, just like the Starks who killed the Night's King long ago didn't realize what was going on, when they kill, when the Hound kills the Night's King, the Night's King will put his mind in Arya's catatonic body, which is pregnant with Roose's kid, the ultimate lineage. And Arya, and her mind's not there, don't forget that, it's the Night's King's mind, Arya will put a sword through the eye of the hound and out his back. She completely disagrees with me on this, but I'm sincerely thinking this is what's going to happen. Now the hound's dead. Sansa's got her baby. Probably it doesn't matter. But I bet that happens at a werewood. And it, it's almost irrelevant if it doesn't. But here, okay, so what I'm about to tell you is the crux. It's the reason why I said at the beginning that... Don't watch this if you don't want to hear how it's going to end. Because this next part, I... I could, Remember what I said about Varamyr, okay? So now it's the Night's King in Arya's mind, and he's got and he's got a dragon, and at this point, somewhere near this area where the Battle of Winterfell is happening, that's when the fourth dragon bursts out of the ground. And remember that I said the Night's King's whole point was to get the Green Seer throne. If that dragon bursts out of the ground, and the Night's King's below the wall, all he has to do is walk through the catacombs where the dragon came out. Walk through the catacombs all the way to where Bran is, who's a cripple and a, par a paraplegic, and take it from him. That's all he has to do. So Bran watches the Hound kill the Night's King and realizes that you can't, that, that's not, that you can't do that. That won't kill him. The body is not the Night's King, it's the mind. So now John is pitted against Arya because he has to kill her body. She is the ultimate evil. Jon's going to have to face who he truly is. He's going to go into the crypts and realize, after he realizes who he truly is, Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark's child, that he's the one who has to unite everybody. Now that Stannis is dead, everybody's dead. He's the one who has to unite everybody. That the battle's not over. That his sister, it's really his cousin, is the ultimate enemy. And he's going to go up to his mom's statue and say, You did this. You... You and Rhaegar ruined everything. If you just would have kept it the way it was, none of this would have happened, and he smashes the head off of his mom. Rob, you've ruined your sword. And there sitting there is Lightbringer. And when and now Jon's got Lightbringer and a dragon. Arya's got a dragon, and she's pregnant. Jon and Arya have what appears to the entire world to be the ultimate battle. And we'll get a chapter where John is on his dragon fighting Arya. And when Martin wrote The Princess and the Queen, there's some epic dragon fights that happen in there. But I bet you he saved some of the best parts for last. We got jousting in the first book. 
jousting is going to have something to do with it because the whole point will be to knock the other person off their dragon. John's going to be trying to knock Arya off her dragon. And it might be with Lightbringer knocking her off. But that that's what the world will think is the final battle in, in the book. But we know it's not. So we get this epic battle, and Jon finally gets to the opposite side of Arya, because Arya fights left-handed. And Jon knocks Arya off. And to him, it's everything. And then we immediately switch to Bran. And it's Bran's fall, because it's Arya falling, but it's Bran's climb. And Bran is going to enter into the Night King's mind, in Arya's body, but it's irrelevant. He enters into the Night King's mind, and remember that scene where Varamyr gets forced out of his eagle during the battle, and it was searing flesh, and his pain and fear seemed to feed the flames and he felt like he went mad for a second that is what Bran's going to feel because that is the mind of the Night's King and Bran's going to see all of the people that the Night's King has stolen their souls all the babies, all the people roost bolt and burning in eternal agony because their bodies are irrelevant now it's their soul, it's hell inside the Night's King's mind and just like we get Bran's chapter where the crow pecks at his in between pecks his eyes out and then between his um, eyebrows before he finds in his third eye and picks out brain matter until it reveals to Bran the fall from the tower, the, the things I do for love. Just like that was so painful to Bran, this fire is going to be completely worse to the nth degree. But Bran's going to have to realize it's not real. This isn't really happening. Ignore it. Force your way through it. And when he gets through the pain, then he's drowning in darkness. Complete darkness, and he can't, he has no air. But he reminds himself, this is not real, Bran. Find something to grasp onto. And he finds something, and it feels like stone, and he starts to climb it. And when he gets to the top, he falls into it through it as if it were a window in the darkness and he gets into it and then it feels like a vast emptiness, a darkling plain as as uh, Martin refers to it in Song for Leah. not the only literary person that's to used that. It. It's the darkling plain. It's complete darkness inside this Night nice King's mind. Because now we're inside the Night's nice King's mind, not the mind of not where he's trapped all these souls, it's the Night's nice King's mind. And Bran sees a light, a tiny burning light in the distance. And I'm, I'm filling in these holes and telling the story myself. Bran's darkness everywhere. Bran sees two, a, a bright red light in the distance, small. And within a second it's in front of him and there are two burning red eyes. We've not seen red eyes. There are two, we've seen blue eyes, brown eyes, black eyes, green eyes, purple eyes. Two burning red eyes of the Night's King. And he spent 6,000 years warging crows and elk and wolves and, pol and bears. He's warged everything ever. And we're going to see these two burning red eyes surrounded by, the, with the fangs of a wolf, the fur of a bear, a scowl on his face, a, a frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. And that is where the real light bringer happens. It's Bran who has to bring light to the darkness of the Night's King's mind. That's the final battle. And it will end with Bran fighting the Night's King. It's really going to be darkness versus light. And it'll end with us not 100% sure how it ended, but knowing that what they were fighting over was the baby inside Arya. I think and it's then good. we just if you bond Mom, you wait wait they're fi they're fighting over the baby that's finish. what they're fighting over they're fighting over the baby inside Arya's belly and we end that chapter we just had the John chapter with him fighting Arya and knocking her off then we immediately get the Bran chapter which is both the fall and the climb and then we end it knowing they're fighting over the baby and not a hundred percent sure how the battle ends. And we end it with the next chapter being John landing next to the crushed body of Arya. 
next to the Weirwood. And her giving, her dead body giving birth. And John having to, I've taught, mentioned this in a previous video. John, we just saw what the Night's King was. Dragon wings, teeth, fangs from the wolf. He's got the hair of a, uh, he's got the claws of a shadow cat, the fur of a bear. He's everything and red eyes and evil. Complete evil. Not to mention we were told that Danny's baby was born with maggots growing in it and all that stuff. We also know that this baby is a descendant of the others and the children of the forest and the first men. It's, it's going to be an abomination. And John is left with the decision of whether to give birth to this baby. Oh, it's going to be born. Whether to let this baby survive or not. And the man who has the sentence must swing the sword. But this baby will be born, and it'll be beautiful, and John will let it live. Because that is the ultimate lesson in this. And it's not you cannot blame a child for his parents' faults. You do your best to make the child the best person it can be. It's their parents' faults are not theirs. Add that to the fact that the Night's King turns out to be the ultimate evil. And we find out that Val is the descendant of the female other's lineage, and so was her sister, Dalla. And watch the video about Rhaegar. Arguably, that's what Rhaegar was trying to do with Dalla, if that's true, or Mance Raider. And that Val, now that the Night's King is done and is not manipulating the others anymore, Val is the key to the others. John lets this baby survive and is going to raise it as his own, or maybe give it to some, give it to Sam to raise, somebody to raise. Um, so we realize the others are arguably more empathetic than humans, because they don't have a war of the five kings, and they do exactly what they're told by their leader. The key is to have a good leader. So now you've got Val, head of the others, and arguably the entire society of man is going to think the war's not over. <laughs> There's an entire society that wants to kill us. There's Val with all the others, and John with all of the men behind him. And it's their decision to, to unite. And John was offered Val previously by Stannis and refused to take it. And just like Ned married Catelyn to solidify their union right before the war and was not in love with Catelyn, and Catelyn not in love with him, but they grew, we get Val and Jon uniting in order to resolve this entire issue. And now that the wall's down, arguably that we get a, a, a dream of spring, so that snow arguably melts. We get a river that divides the other's territory and some wildlings, including arguably the Magnar of Thin. You get the division of their cultures from the rest of the um, cultures, and you, you could get a nice bridge across it. And arguably, there's weirwood roots underneath it that are feeding off of it because that was what fell. That was the wall. So Bran, being able to control the weirwood roots, could blockade anybody that came through. And John and Val connect, resolve all the war differences. We get, and so the reason I mentioned the others was to bring back the whole point of the ultimate truths Martin's trying to say. You cannot blame a child for the faults of their parents. And you must understand a culture in order to truly be able to treat with them and form a mutual respect. And sometimes you need a border in between it. But it's not about a border to say, F you. It's about a border saying, we're culturally divided, let's just agree that we'll, to, we'll be on our own and we'll do our own thing and not mess with each other. And that the, it's not society that does evil things. It's the manipulation of the people in power that, does, that creates evil. The Night's King. That's how we resolve the ultimate issue. And I'm sure there's going to be something about Tyrion resolving the Bank of Bravos, probably by selling Casterly Rock, uh, gold to Casterly Rock to them, which is probably nothing. There's a whole... Uh, you get who's supposed to be in charge of different areas. Some say... Well, I think we might be in disagreement on this now. I think Rickon's going to be in charge of Winterfell. Davos is going to help him. Uh, I think so. there's a whole bunch of different things. But what I just described is the ultimate battle. And everybody will, everybody in the story will say John is Azor High. He is a light bringer. But we'll know he is awesome for everything he did, John is. But he's not light bringer. Bran's light bringer. 
And that's what Martin's playing with. You mythologies build on themselves. But it won't matter that no one knows Bran's not the Lightbringer because it's stored for all history what he did. It's stored in the Weirwood roots. And the next Green Seer will be aware of it. And, let me add this, now that there's a tunnel between Winterfell and um, the Green Seer throne because of that dragon that came through, now that there's a tunnel between those two, wouldn't it be great if we find out at the end, say we get an epilogue five years later, Rickon's getting married, in my opinion, to Shireen Baratheon, but we get all these people meeting back together, and it's a beautiful thing. We see how these kids are growing, and we even get some kind of inclination that one of these kids is going to be the next Green Seer and is communicating with a werewolf. Wouldn't it be great if Rickon says to John or somebody that he's been walking with Shaggy Dog deeper and deeper into those crypts? And what are those crypts? Those crypts are the generations of Starks going further and further back. Until you ultimately see real, the real history of every, implying that Rickon is this close to finding out brands at the bottom of that, and that's the unification of the original pact between First Men and the Children of the Forest. It's the Green Seer Throne and Winterfell connected beneath the um, beneath what is now the river that was the Wall, um, and no others in Whites can get into the Green Seer throne, but they can, you, it's a back door. They just, I don't know if I'm right, but what I just described to you, and a lot of it is me making up specifics so I can show you how the story is ultimately going to go. The specifics I'm not 100% sure on. But let me end with this. She, I'm going to let her talk and rip me apart in just a second. Um, the, there is a song that is sung by a singer at the the Purple Wedding that is supposedly 77 lines long. And we only get like the first five lines, and Tyrion's listening to it and just ignores it. He even fills in one of the lines as a jest. Martin's written the song. Quite literally, in my opinion, Martin has written a song that is meant to be a summation of this entire story. And it will be the last lines of the book, a song being sung. And it will have to do with the Night's King, with John, with Ray. It will be everything surmised, but not too detailed. So that if you and I, wanting to tell our little kids a story, can say this song. And I bet you that's the song they end the last episode with. But we can tell the kids this song so that later when they grow up, they can read the books and go, Mom, you've been telling me this song my whole life. So let me give you the only lines of the song we know. Now, the way the song's written is stanza, uh, is stanza and then like a chorus in the background, um, almost like the muses in an old um, epic say a single line in between the rhyming verses. So, A, A, random line, B, B, random line. Those random lines are meant to be omitted in my opinion, so I'm just going to give you the other parts. The Dark Lord brooded high in his tower. In a castle as black as the night, he feasted on bloodlust and envy, and filled his cup full up with spite. My brother once ruled seven kingdoms, he said to his Herod and wife. I'll take what was his, and make it all mine. Let his son feel the point of my knife. There's a couple of other lines, but that but we don't really know where they go because Tyrion interrupts them. And we, so we don't know the whole song, but I bet you that that's part of the 77, I bet Martin has 77 lines in a song he's written that will be at the end of this, the ultimate song of Ice and Fire, which is the mythology they're meant to tell their children. Thank y'all for watching me wax poetic, and thank you mm, so much for not justifiably interrupting me and ripping me apart.